This is chapter 22, part B on the digestive system. Right, so at the end of the last section, we finished off talking about the mouth and any um, associated structures with the mouth. So continuing on our journey through the GI tract, the alimentary canal. Um, next would be the pharynx or the throat. So after we swallow food in the mouth, um, it's going to pass from the mouth into the oropharynx um, and then into the laryngeopharynx. So this will allow passage of food, um, fluids, as well as air. Um, and it's going to be composed of your stratified squamous epithelial uh, tissue with some mucous glands. So then from the pharynx, the food will now enter into the esophagus. So the esophagus is just kind of a flat muscular tube that's going to connect um, that laryngeopharynx and the throat all the way down into the stomach. Um, so when we're not swallowing food, it's pretty much flat and collapsed, um, tucked there behind the trachea. Okay. Uh, so once it reaches the stomach, it's going to have to pierce through the diaphragm um, through what's called the esophageal hiatus. Um, so it's just kind of a break in the diaphragm where the esophagus can pass through. Um, so this would also be the location where uh, people could get hernias. So some parts of the stomach or the esophagus kind of herniate out of this opening. Um, so from there it's going to join the stomach at the cardial orifice or just the uh, initial opening of the stomach. Um, there's also a sphincter muscle um, called the gastroesophageal or the cardiac sphincter that's going to surround this opening to the stomach that's going to kind of control when and how much food is allowed into the stomach at any time. So generally when food's not being swallowed it's going to remain closed um, so that we don't get a lot of acid reflux and things um, going back up the esophagus. Um, and there's also uh, plenty of mucus cells within the stomach and this area to help protect that esophagus from any acid reflux that may occur. So looking at some histology of the esophagus, so it still has those same four alimentary canal layers that we talked about. So the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and uh, the serosa or the outermost layer. Um, so the esophageal mucosa is going to contain that stratified squamous again. Um, and then as we get closer to the stomach, it'll change more to a simple columnar. Um, so there's some glands in the esophagus that are also going to secrete mus uh, mucus to aid in that bolus or the food movement. So we don't want a dry esophagus that food can maybe get stuck, so we keep it nice and slimy and coated in mucus to help things slide down into the stomach. Okay. Um, the muscularis externa of the esophagus is composed of skeletal muscle superiorly um, and then mixed with some smooth muscle in the middle and uh, inferior. Um, and it has adventitia instead of serosa. So serosa is more like the visceral peritoneum. Adventitia is just a little bit more tough, dense, fibrous connective tissue. So some digestive processes of the mouth um, <clears throat> that we've covered so far. So the pharynx and the esophagus are primarily just passageways for food to reach the mouth um, to the stomach. Uh, so the major function digestive process so far um, is propulsion that's going to start with swallowing or deglutition. Um, so deglutition involves two um, phases. So we have to coordinate a lot of muscle groups to swallow accurately so we don't choke. Um, so two phases of swallowing or deglutition are the buccal phase. Um, so this would be your voluntary contraction of the tongue. Um, so when you uh, voluntarily start to contract those muscles and start the process of swallowing. Um, so then the second phase that follows that is the pharyngeal esophageal phase. So this is involuntary, um, meaning that uh, we have no control over this. So once we initiate swallowing, then kind of our involuntary and smooth muscle in the esophagus will carry it uh, through the rest of the way. Okay, so this is showing the two phases of deglutition or swallowing. So buccal phase, right, the food's still in the mouth. We're preparing to swallow. Uh, so we will uh, contract <clears throat> our upper esophageal sphincter. So we'll 
you know, contract those muscles, get ready to swallow. The tongue is going to push the food up against the hard palate um, and toward that oropharynx, toward the back of the throat. So after swallowing has been initiated, then we enter into the involuntary uh, pharyngeal esophageal phase. Right? So here the soft palate um, and the uvula are going to rise and close off that nasopharynx. So the food is only going to go down into the esophagus and not back up right and out your nose. Okay. Um, so this is why sometimes if you um, are laughing right when you're drinking something, it can shoot out your nose um, because you're not using the correct swallowing muscles um, kind of in the accurate order so that nasopharynx doesn't get completely closed off. Okay. Um, and then also during swallowing that uh, epiglottis is going to close the larynx to the trachea um, so that food doesn't go down into the windpipe. Okay, so now that we've swallowed, the food has gone through the esophagus and entered the stomach. Right, so now we can look at the stomach. So the stomach is just a temporary storage tank that's going to begin um, our major chemical breakdown of proteins. Um, so remember we started the chemical digestion of carbohydrates in the mouth with the saliva. Um, so now we're going to start to chemically break down those other uh, nutrient groups. So now the bolus, that ball of food and saliva, and once it enters the stomach, it's going to um, get mixed with the digestive juices and hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So now we refer to it as chyme. Um, so when the stomach is empty, it has these folds on the internal surface called uh, rugae. And so these rugae um, are just the folds of the stomach that allow it to expand when we eat. It's going to allow it to stretch out um, when our stomach's full. So some major regions of the stomach. So the cardial part or the cardia is going to surround that cardial orifice or the opening of the stomach where food enters. Um, the fundus is just kind of this dome-shaped portion of the stomach that's going to rest just beneath the diaphragm. Um, and then the body is kind of the broad mid-portion of the stomach. So then toward the bottom or the end of the uh, stomach is the pyloric region or the pyloric part. Um, so it consists of the pyloric antrum, which is kind of the more superior, uh, broader region. And then as we get toward the end, it's going to get a little bit more narrow into the pyloric canal. And finally, terminating at the pyloric sphincter or pylorus. Um, so this is where food leaves the stomach and will then enter into the duodenum of the small intestine. So there is a pyloric sphincter or valve here that's also going to control the rate at which the stomach empties. So we don't want all of the food to just rush straight through into the intestine. So we can open and close the sphincter um, as needed. Right, so looking at some gross anatomy of the stomach, so we have the greater curvature, which would be the convex or the lateral side, so it's the bigger curve of the stomach, and then the lesser curvature is the concave medial, or the smaller curve. Um, so the stomach is going to be tethered um, to other digestive organs and in the abdominal cavity by the mesenteries. Um, so one of the mesenteries that help to anchor the stomach in place is the lesser omentum. So this is going to attach the stomach from that lesser curvature um, into the liver. So then the greater omentum is going to drape kind of from the greater curvature and then over the intestines and the colon. Um, and eventually will blend in with that mesocolon, mesentery, um, that's anchoring the intestines to the abdominal wall. So looking at some microscopic anatomy of the stomach. So the stomach wall is still going to contain those same four tunics that we listed, or four layers of the alimentary canal. So it has the uh, mucosa, the submucosa, um, the muscularis, and the uh, serosa. Um, but one difference in the stomach is that the uh, muscularis and the mucosa are slightly modified um, to reflect the functions of the stomach. So with the muscularis layer, 
Um, we still have the circular and the longitudinal, but we've added a third oblique layer. So the oblique layer um, is just going to run kind of diagonal from our circular and longitudinal layers. Um, so this allows the stomach to churn um, and mix and move the food um, that's entered the stomach. So we can contract these muscles in three different directions to kind of churn and break it down even further. We said the mucosa was also slightly modified um, to reflect its function, um, especially to deal with the high acidic environment of the stomach. Um, so the mucosa of the stomach is going to consist of your simple columnar epithelia. So we just have a single layer of some column shaped cells that have uh, a lot of mucus cells within them. So the stomach cells are always secreting this alkaline mucus to try to um, protect that tissue from the acidity from the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Um, so the epithelia inside the stomach will be dotted or uh, kind of covered in these gastric pits, these little pores that are going to go down into our gastric glands. Right, so there's a few different types of gastric glands and cells um, that we'll look at, but they're going to produce the gastric juices and secretions. So there's a couple different types of glands and cells in the lining of the stomach. Um, most of these will be found in the fundus and the body region. Um, so some glands include our secretory cells like the mucus cells to produce that alkaline mucus, um, parietal cells here shown in the blue, uh, chief cells, the purple ones, and then we have some enteroendocrine cells shown in green. Okay, so the mucus cells are just going to produce mucus. If you see, majority of the cells, especially near the surface, are just mucus cells. So we have to produce lots of this alkaline mucus to help um, protect the surface from the acids in the stomach. Okay. Um, your parietal cells are going to produce the hydrochloric acid. Um, so the hydrochloric acid works to denature the proteins um, and break down things like plant cell walls and also kill a lot of bacteria that may have entered the stomach. Another secretion produced by the parietal cells are um, intrinsic factor. Um, so we talked about intrinsic factor a little bit in the endocrine system chapter. Um, or the blood chapter, we talked about anemia. So intrinsic factor is required for absorption of vitamin B12 in the intestine. So if we don't have um, intrinsic factor, we can't absorb B12. B12 is used for red blood cell production. So this can lead to your pernicious anemia. Right. So the chief cells here shown in purple are going to secrete pepsinogen. So pepsinogen is the inactive version of the enzyme. Um, so it has to be activated by hydrochloric acid. Right? So it gets activated and now it's referred to as pepsin. Right? Um, so it's kind of a positive feedback mechanism. So um, it's just showing that protein digestion um, is going to work better when we have both enzymes as opposed to just one or the other. So the pepsin is not going to become activated until there's hydrochloric acid produced. Um, they'll also release some lipase enzymes that are going to help digest your lipids. Okay, the enteroendocrine cells are going to secrete hormone-like substances, um, chemical messengers, um, but they're going to act more like the paracrines. Okay, so things like serotonin, histamine, somatostatin, uh, gastrins, like the hunger hormone. Um, so these are just going to affect local um, digestive cells. So they're not really going to travel all throughout the body um, like true hormones. Um, so the mucosal barrier we said produced by the stomach is required to um, protect that internal lining of the stomach against those acids and digestive uh, secretions. So the mucosal barrier protects the stomach 
um, and it's created by three factors. So we have a thick layer of bicarbonate rich mucus, so it's very alkaline, so it's going to help to neutralize or counteract the acidity of the stomach environment. Um, we also have tight junctions between those epithelial cells to prevent any uh, juices from kind of seeping out from the tissue. Um, and we also have some stem cells so that any epithelial cells that are damaged are able to be quickly replaced. So some digestive processes that are carried out by the stomach. Um, so we said it carries out the breakdown of the food. So it churns and grinds to help physically break down the food a little bit more. Uh, also serves as a holding area for food. So the food can kind of sit in our stomach and give um, those enzymes and things time to work. Um, it's going to deliver that chyme to the small intestine to continue its journey through the GI tract. Um, hydrochloric acid produced by the stomach is going to start to denature those proteins, um, as well as the pepsin enzyme. It's also going to start to digest and break down proteins. So we have some propulsion. So the chyme is going to be uh, propelled toward the uh, pyloric region of the stomach. Um, so it can grind and churn as well. Um, and then we can uh, open this valve slightly to allow small amounts, a little at a time, to enter the intestines. So some other processes that occur in the stomach, so things like lipid soluble substances like alcohol, aspirins can be absorbed into the bloodstream from the stomach. Um, so the only stomach function that's really essential to life though, so is that secretion of intrinsic factor for B12 absorption. Um, so technically someone could live without their stomach, a lot of people do. Um, they have just a feeding tube or it goes um, directly into the intestine and just bypasses the stomach. Um, but really the only thing that we require from the stomach um, is that intrinsic factor. So again, like I said, B12 is needed for red blood cell development. Um, so if you don't have intrinsic factor, you don't have B12, so you don't have uh, adequate blood cells, which could lead to your pernicious anemia. And it would have to be treated with the injections because if we were to just supplement B12, um, the person wouldn't be able to absorb it in their digestive tract because they lack their intrinsic factor. So regulation of gastric secretion can be broken down into three phases. So some things that can trigger secretions um, from the stomach or secretory activity from the stomach. Um, so one is a cephalic phase or a reflex phase. So cephalic meaning kind of in your head, so brain. Um, so this is basically just the sight or thought of food. Um, the gastric phase, so gastric meaning stomach, so this would be stimulated by um, distension of the stomach. So when the stomach uh, food enters the stomach, it's going to stretch the stomach and we have stretch receptors to detect those. Um, intestinal phase would be where those partially digested foods from the stomach are now entering into the intestines. Okay. Um, so like I said, cephalic phase is more like a reflex, um, so it can be triggered by smell, taste, sight, or even thought. So if you smell something um, that smells really good, smells tasty, your stomach starts, can start to growl and secrete some of those digestive juices um, kind of in anticipation of receiving food. Right. Gastric phase, um, like I said basically distension of the stretch receptors in the stomach. Um, are going to let the brain know that foods entered the stomach, so we need to start producing or secreting these digestive enzymes. Okay. Um, and then the intestinal phase is going to be stimulated by food starting to enter the intestine. So that's going to tell um, the, uh, the glands to continue to secrete their enzymes or their digestive juices. Okay, so looking at some accessory structures that are not part of the alimentary canal but do contribute to digestion. They're going to produce a lot of our digestive juices and enzymes. Um, so the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas are all accessory organs associated with the small intestine. 
Um, so the function of the liver um, in terms of digestion is bile production. So it does have other functions as well. So it's kind of the body's detoxification center. Um, but for digestion purposes, it's going to produce bile. So bile is essentially a fat emulsifier. So it's going to help to physically break up the fat or the lipids to increase the surface area um, for digestion. So with things like carbohydrates and proteins, we can physically break those down by chewing or churning in the stomach. Um, but lipids, things like oil, it's a little bit harder to just physically chew and break it apart into smaller pieces, right? So we have bile to essentially um, kind of break it up so we go from a large oil drop to many small oil droplets. So now we have more surface area for those enzymes to act on. So instead of only being able to um, act on the edge of this large drop, now we can act on the perimeter of all of these droplets. Um, the gallbladder's function is to store the bile produced by the liver. Right? So it's our bile storage area. Um, and then the pancreas is going to um, secrete a lot of pancreatic digestive enzymes um, needed to help digest that chyme and break it down, um, as well as neutralize the stomach acid. Okay? Um, so we've talked about the pancreas before. It also has a role in the endocrine system. It's going to produce your insulin and glucagon. But as far as its digestive purposes, um, it's going to secrete some of those digestive juices and enzymes. Okay. Um, so just looking at some gross anatomy of the liver. So technically it is a gland because it's going to secrete bile. Um, so it's the largest gland in the body. Um, it's composed of four primary lobes. So we have a right lobe, uh, the left lobe, the uh, caudate lobe, the small one here, and then the quadrate lobe. Okay. Um, so when people do liver transplant, since the liver um, is unique in that it's able to regenerate and repair itself unlike other organs, um, so during liver transplants, they generally will only transplant one lobe or one section of the liver. Um, so then the person that receives the donated liver, um, it can regenerate and grow a new complete liver. And the person that donated the liver, um, theirs will regrow that lobe and heal. Okay. Um, the falciform ligament is going to be found kind of in the middle, separating those left and right lobes. Um, it's also going to help to suspend and anchor that liver from the diaphragm and the abdominal wall. Uh, the round ligament is more of a remnant of the fetal umbilical vein, um, and it's going to come off of that falciform ligament. Um, so we said the lesser omentum is going to help anchor the liver um, in the abdominal cavity to the stomach. Um, and it's also going to contain your hepatic artery and vein um, are going to enter into the liver at this porta hepatis. Right? So this kind of opening or this hole in the posterior side of the liver will be where all of these ducts and blood vessels and things are going to enter and run through. Okay. Um, so the bile ducts um, would be where the bile is going to be secreted from. So the uh, common hepatic duct here is going to leave the liver. Okay. Um, and the cystic duct is going to connect to the gallbladder. So we have a uh, so we have our duct here. It's not even going to show up in one here. So the cystic duct coming off of the gallbladder, the hepatic duct coming off of the, litter, the liver. So then where these two are going to uh, unite or merge right here um, is going to form what's called the bile duct. Um, so it's a microscopic anatomy of the liver. So the liver um, is structured in lobules. Um, so they're little hexagon units uh, composed of plates of hepatocytes right, or liver cells. Um, so these individual lobules or hepatocytes are what's actually going to do the filtering and the processing of the blood. Okay. Um, so there's a central vein 
located in the center of each lobule um, that's going to help drain that blood. Um, so each lobule, each little hexagon is going to be composed of a portal triad. So in each corner of the hexagon, right, we'll have um, one of these little triads. Right? Um, so it's going to contain part of the hepatic artery to supply the oxygen. Um, part of the hepatic portal vein to uh, bring that nutrient rich blood from the intestines. So remember hepatic portal circulation so all of the blood and nutrients or nutrients that enter the blood through the intestine has to be filtered and processed before we return it to systemic circulation. So blood uh, draining from the digestive organs is going to enter into the liver to be filtered before it returns into the vena cava. So that hepatic portal vein is going to bring in that nutrient-rich blood from the intestine. Um, and then we have a bile duct, shown in green, that's going to receive the bile that's produced um, by these cells. Um, so we said bile was for fat emulsification. Um, so it's a yellowish-green, very alkaline solution. Um, so it contains bile salts and bilirubin. Right, so the bile salts are what are actively um, functioning in the emulsification. The bilirubin is just the yellowish pigment. Um, so it's actually formed from the breakdown of that red heme pigment in red blood cells. So when red blood cells deteriorate or break down, we recycle that heme pigment um, and convert it into uh, bilirubin. So it goes from red to yellow. Um, so you can kind of see this when you get a bruise. So it starts out you know, kind of black and blue and purple um, and red and then over a few days it turns more kind of yellowish greenish looking. So that heme is being broken down into bilirubin. Okay. Um, so then throughout the digestive process some bacteria can also break down this pigment even further into um, stercobilin um, which is going to give feces their brown color. Okay. So looking at the gallbladder we said was just a uh, storage um, for the bile produced by the liver. Okay. Um, so technically you don't need your gallbladder to live. Lots of people have to get their uh, gallbladders removed if they have uh, gallstones or blockages. Um, so in that case the bile would just go directly from the liver to the intestine. Okay. Um, so when it contracts it will release the bile through the cystic duct here. So just the duct coming from the gallbladder and then it enters and flows to the bile duct and empties into the small intestine. So the pancreas is our next accessory organ. It's also going to produce um, some digestive enzymes called, um, we just kind of lump together and call it pancreatic juice. Um, so remember we said the uh, pancreas also produces hormones, it has an endocrine function. Um, so the endocrine portion of the pancreas are going to be your islets of Langerhans. Um, so they're going to secrete their hormones, insulin and glucagon, directly into the blood. Um, and they're called islets because when we look at a cross section they look kind of like little islands in the tissue. So. Um, the exocrine function, the digestive function of the pancreas to produce this pancreatic juice is going to fall under the role of the acinar cells. Right? So these are all connected to the pancreatic duct. Right? So remember, exocrine glands have to secrete into a duct. So the duct is what's going to carry those pancreatic enzymes and juices um, to the intestine. And these are produced again by the acinar cells, um, which are just little clusters of the secretory cells that are going to produce the enzymes. So some composition of pancreatic juice. Um, so roughly 12 to 1500 mils per day is produced. Um, so it's a pretty alkaline solution to help counteract and neutralize that acidic chyme that's coming from the stomach. Remember, the stomach has a lot of hydrochloric acid to break down and uh, denature the proteins. So now once we get into the intestine, we want to kind of neutralize that a little bit. Um, there's also some electrolytes, so things like sodium, potassium, 
um, in the secretions, and then of course your digestive enzymes. Um, so we have some proteases to uh, help digest proteins. Amylase, we said, was for carbohydrates. So it's the same amylase that we saw in the saliva. Um, lipases for lipids um, and some nucleases for nucleic acids like DNA. Right, so now our food has entered into the small intestine. Right, so we've um, added our bile and our pancreatic juices into the uh, small intestine. Um, so the small intestine is the major organ of digestion and absorption. So up until this point, we haven't had a whole lot of nutrient absorption. We've been mainly focusing on mechanically breaking the food down by chewing, um, turning of the stomach, and starting a little bit of chemical digestion um, in the stomach with those um, hydrochloric acid and pepsins. Okay. Um, so the small intestine is about two to four meters long, which is up to 13 feet. Um, so all the way from the end of the stomach to the ileocecal valve where it joins the large intestine. Okay. Um, it has a relatively small diameter though, of only about one to one and a half inches. So there's three subdivisions or regions of the small intestine. So the first region is the duodenum or the duodenum, either pronunciation is fine. Um, so the duodenum is just the first part that's going to connect to the stomach and receive those pancreatic enzymes and the bile and the chyme from the stomach. Um, so it's only about 10 inches long uh, and it's going to curve around the head of the pancreas there. Um, so the mid portion of the intestine is the jejunum. Um, so it's about 8 foot long and it will be where a lot of the uh, absorption, nutrient absorption is going to take place. Okay. Um, and then finally the third region, the last region is the ileum. Um, so it's going to eventually join with the um, large intestine at that ileocecal valve. Okay. Um, so it's called the ileocecal valve because the last part of the small intestine is the ileum. The first part of the large intestine is the cecum. So we just kind of combine these two words, ileocecal. Okay. So the small intestine being since um, it's the major organ for absorption, it has some structural modifications to enhance its ability to absorb those nutrients. Um, so one of those, of course, was the length. So the food will spend several hours in the intestine, so we try to maximize our absorption. Uh, but some other structural modifications are uh, things to help in, uh, increase the surface area. So we have more surface area for nutrient absorption. Um, so it's estimated the surface area of the small intestine is about the size of a tennis court. So if we were to lay out all the uh, lining of the small intestine right flat out, um, it would cover pretty much a tennis court. So some of these modifications include the circular folds. Right? So instead of just having a smooth tube, we have all these folds and ridges to kind of slow down the flow of the food. Um, we have some villi um, and then microvilli. All right, so again, the circular folds are just going to kind of force the chyme to move more slowly. And as it moves, it's going to kind of spiral through um, the small intestine. So this just allows it to spend more time in the intestine so we maximize our nutrient absorption. Um, the villi are the finger-like projections on um, the mucosa of the intestine. Um, so it's going to contain your capillary beds as well as those lacteals. Remember the lacteals we talked about in the lymphatic system will be where uh, lipids and fats will be digested and absorbed. Um, and then the microvilli are extensions of the villi. So we have the villi and then within the villi we have the microvilli. So the microvilli is sometimes called the brush border. Um, so if you were to look at this under the microscope it would just have kind of a fuzzy appearance near the lumen and that would be those microvilli. Um, but this is going to be what secretes um, some more digestive enzymes. Just kind of there's several but we just lump them all into uh, brush border enzymes to kind of finalize, put the finishing touches on our carbohydrate and protein digestion. Right, so again, to increase the surface area, so instead of only being able to absorb 
nutrients through here, we can absorb nutrients all over the surface of these villi. So some digestive processes that occur in the small intestine. So once the chyme leaves the stomach and enters the duodenum, um, it's still only partially digested. So we have to complete the digestive processes so we can undergo absorption. So it'll spend three to six hours in the small intestine to absorb all the nutrients and most of the water. Um, so again, some substances such as bile, the bicarbonate, digestive enzymes um, will all be delivered from the liver and the pancreas. Okay? Um, and then those brush border enzymes um, from the microvilli are going to perform the final digestion. So kind of the finishing touches um, or whatever's left over that needs to be broken down will be broken down at this stage by these brush border enzymes. Um, so motility of the small intestine. So after a meal, segmentation occurs. Um, it's the most common motion of the small intestine. So it's kind of like peristalsis, but instead of kind of just going in one direction, it's going to kind of go back and forth, back and forth, kind of churning and mixing the bolus or the chyme and <clears throat> the digestive juices as it's moving throughout the GI tract. <clears throat> Okay, so it's an overview of everything we've looked at so far. Right? So we started with the mouth. Right? So major functions of the mouth include um, your ingestion. So food is introduced into um, the digestive tract through the oral cavity. And then propulsion, so swallowing. Right? Uh, mechanical breakdown by chewing. Right? And then a little bit of digestion of carbohydrates by that salivary amylase. Right, so the pharynx and the esophagus are going to primarily just function in propulsion. So it's going to transfer the food from the mouth into the stomach. So once we get to the stomach, some functions there include we have our mechanical breakdown. So the churning of the stomach. So those three muscular layers are going to churn and help break down the food more. Um, propulsion. So we're going to uh, move the food along toward the duodenum of the intestine. Um, digestion also starts to occur here. So pepsin, um, hydrochloric acid are going to begin protein digestion. And there are also some lipases for lipid digestion. Um, and then a little bit of absorption of select substances. Um, so some drugs, alcohol, aspirin can pass through and enter the blood through the stomach. Um, and then the small intestine and the associated accessory organs, so your liver, gallbladder, pancreas. Um, so mechanical breakdown and propulsion. So the segmentation um, of the intestine is going to help to break it down more and mix it. Um, and then propulsion is going to continue moving along the tract toward the large intestine. We also have our primary digestion uh, occurring at this stage. So all of the digestive enzymes released by the pancreas and the liver and the, uh, the microvilli, the brush border enzymes, are all going to complete the digestion and break down the food. And now we'll start to have our major absorption. So once the food's completely digested and chemically broken down into those basic building blocks, so the molecules are small enough now to pass through um, the membrane into the blood, right? so now they can be absorbed. Um, and then our next section we'll look at is the large intestine. So there's a little bit of digestion that occurs here, but it's primarily by our enteric bacteria or the bacteria that live in your gut. Right? They're going to kind of finish any extra digestion we may not have been able to do ourselves. Um, and then some absorption, although most of the absorption occurs in the small intestine, any remaining water, electrolytes, or uh, vitamins produced by bacteria will be able to take those up. Um, propulsion, so it's just going to keep moving it along toward um, the rectum, right, for defecation. So this will be where we eliminate um, any waste or indigestible materials from the body. 
So looking at the large intestine, right? So the first uh, region of the large intestine is the cecum. Right? So remember we said um, that ileocecal valve is kind of the transition from the small intestine, the ileum of the small intestine, to the cecum of the large intestine. Okay. Um, so the appendix that we talked about in the lymphatic system, part of that mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue or MALT, um, is also going to be found coming here off the cecum. Um, so it essentially serves kind of like a bacteria storehouse or prison. Um, so that's why it's very dangerous if the appendix were to rupture because now all of these pathogens that have been kind of locked away um, are now running free in the abdominal cavity. So looking at the colon, right, so after we pass through the cecum, we enter the colon. Right? So there's a few regions of the colon, starting with the ascending colon. So this is going to ascend or go up um, superiorly toward um, on the right side of the abdominal cavity. Okay? Um, so then that's going to lead into the transverse colon. So transverse is going to just cut across the abdominal cavity um, and then it's going to lead into the descending colon so descending is going down the left side of the abdominal cavity um, and then the last part of the colon is the sigmoid colon so it's just kind of this s-shaped or kinked version of um, or portion of the colon um, that's going to travel through the pelvis to the rectum So we mentioned the gut bacteria can also assist us with our digestion. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as the bacterial flora. So there's a thousand different types of bacteria um, that live in our guts that outnumber our own cells 10 to 1. So bacteria are very small compared to our own cells. So we're able to fit more bacteria in our bodies than our own body cells. So some metabolic functions of bacteria our gut bacteria include fermentation, so they're able to digest things um, like some starches or carbohydrates maybe we're not able to digest on our own with our own enzymes. Maybe they can produce different digestive enzymes for us. Um, so it's kind of a symbiotic relationship, so we both benefit. So the bacteria benefit by having a place to live and free food, essentially, and we benefit by um, getting that extra assistance and digestion and maybe some extra vitamins and nutrients. Um, so like termites or um, cattle that are able to eat grass, right? So humans can't eat wood or grass um, because of the cellulose in the plant cell walls. We Our bodies just can't break down that cellulose or that carbohydrate. Um, but uh, the termites have a special bacteria that live in their gut and that's able to help them digest and break down that cellulose in the wood. Um, like I said, some bacteria can also make vitamins for us. So some B vitamins, vitamin K, um, are all actually produced by our bacteria friends. Um, another benefit of the gut bacteria is that they help to keep pathogenic bacteria from uh, taking hold. So essentially the good bacteria are going to crowd out the bad bacteria. Um, so if we have enough good bacteria, so think your uh, probiotics or um, like if you eat yogurt that has the good bacteria that's going to help keep your digestive system healthy. Um, so the good bacteria are going to pretty much use up all the space and the nutrients and the resources so the bad bacteria don't really have a good place to set up a colony. So in the large intestine, the uh, residue, the food, lef leftover nutrients and things are going to remain roughly 12 to 24 hours. So again, there's no real breakdown or digestion occurring here except what the gut bacteria are able to do for us. Um, so any vitamins that they may synthesize, any um, excess water electrolytes, we can reabsorb at this point. Um, but the major function of your large intestine is just to propel the feces and the indigestible waste to the anus for defecation. Okay, so now we can look at some mechanisms of digestion and absorption. Um, so digestion is a chemical process of breaking these uh, nutrient molecules, food molecules, down into their basic chemical building blocks. 
So only um, these molecules are going to be small enough to be able to be absorbed and cross that wall of the small intestine. So for example, um, say you eat a hamburger, right? So when you eat meat, you're essentially just eating pure protein. So we have these large molecules um, that through digestive processes as it passes through the alimentary canal, it's going to be broken down into smaller and smaller molecules until we get to kind of the most basic level of um, these molecules or their building blocks. So the building blocks for proteins are amino acids. So digestion is a catabolic process, meaning that we're breaking down larger molecules to smaller molecules, right? So we're breaking down polymers or large complex molecules into simple single monomers. Okay? Um, so the monomers are what's going to be absorbed in the intestines. Um, so our digestive enzymes are going to carry out chemical reactions called hydrolysis reactions um, where essentially we're adding water to break the chemical bonds. So lysis means to split or break apart something. Hydro means water. So we're using water to split the bonds, the chemical bonds. So this example, so say we have two monomers or two amino acids linked together by covalent bonds, so they're sharing electrons. So we add some water, H2O, so that's going to add an OH to monomer 1 and a hydrogen to monomer 2. So this oxygen that was linking these two now becomes an OH. So now they're separated um, and no longer linked together. So when we look at digestion of carbohydrates, uh, we're trying to break down the starches um, and carbohydrates into simple single monosaccharide sugars. So things like glucose, um, fructose, galactose. Um, so starches and disaccharides can be broken down um, and this process again is going to begin in the mouth with that salivary amylase. So then from there we can break it down further um, into things like lactose or maltose, sucrose. Um, but the final end product, our end uh, goal, is to get these single monosaccharide sugars. Um, so things like glucose, fructose, and galactose. So digestion of proteins, um, so we're going to take large proteins and break them down to polypeptides to get smaller and smaller until we get to those single amino acids. Okay. Um, so source of proteins not only dietary but we can also um, include digestive enzymes and proteins from breakdown of mucosal cells. So all of the digestive enzymes um, at previous stages of digestion. So enzymes are proteins also. So once those enzymes have performed their function, uh, we can break those down as well and use their, use their amino acids. Okay. Um, so protein digestion generally is going to begin in the stomach when we have the pepsin and hydrochloric acid. It's going to start to denature um, these large proteins. Uh, digestion of lipids, right? So remember we said that lipids we can't really mechanically or physically break down as easily. Um, so we have to use that bile for emulsification. So we have to um, kind of pre-treat the lipids um, to get them ready for digestion. Um, and this is again because lipids are insoluble in water. So most of the fluid environment in the digestive system is water based, right? So um, in order to get these oils and these lipids to kind of dissolve in those digestive fluids, we have to pre treat them with our bile emulsification. Um, so then we can use some enzymes like uh, lipases produced by the pancreas um, to break down these fat molecules into single fatty acids. So we go from maybe a triglyceride into just a single fatty acid. Okay. Um, these can also lead to a uh, micelle formation. Um, so this would just be where um, the little oil droplets or fat droplets um, are going to become coated with those bile salts and um, emulsify. Right? So then finally, um, diffusion of the lipids as they leave the micelles, they can cross that epithelial membrane um, and then enter into that lacteal 
for the uh, lymphatic system. So it's showing the process of lipid digestion. So say we have a large fat globule or oil droplet, oil globule. Um, so we add our bile salts to emulsify it. So we're going to split it up into smaller fat droplets. Right? So these bile salts will keep these droplets from kind of reforming into the large droplet. Right, so now um, we've increased the surface area. We've got smaller droplets that are easier to work with. So um, our lipases, our digestive enzymes, will start to break down these um, triglycerides, these uh, large lipids, into free fatty acids. Okay. So now the micelles um, are just going to be like the little sacs or the little cells um, that are going to carry these digested fatty acids um, across the membrane. So it will diffuse across um, and they'll enter into our lacteals. Right? So they'll be carried away from the intestine in the lymphatic fluid where they'll be processed and cleaned and filtered.